Hello, fellow Rebel Capitalists. Hope you are well. I wanted to go over some research I've done on the jobs data over the weekend. And if you listen to the last video I did on this, I believe Friday, I was really trying to parse through the idea or really trying to reconcile, maybe a better way of saying it, the data that we've got two negative quarters of real GDP, while at the same time, if you're watching the mainstream media, they're saying that the jobs numbers are just incredible. We've never seen a jobs market like this. Therefore, the economy must be booming. We must be going through this economic boom. In fact, I uh, let's go to this story from Yahoo real quick to set up the rest of the video. They said, astonishing labor market recovery from the pandemic is complete astonishing or astounding <laughs> excuse me i get the, the economy's booming so much i'm getting overly excited <laughs> but uh, as you guys know the economy added 528,000 jobs and they're just the mainstream media is just freaking out over this they they cannot contain their enthusiasm one thing i wanted to point out is this chart, the job market recovery, quote unquote, after the pandemic reduced, I think they're meant to say induced, uh, recession in 2020. And again, it wasn't the pandemic, it was the government's response to the pandemic, has been remarkably rapid compared to other notable recoveries in recent history. So the first thing they do in the article is point out the time that it took. So this chart shows change since peak employment, and uh, it gives you a timeline, so in months. So we are now officially back up to the same number of jobs we had in 2019 prior to the Cervasa sickness, and it only took, what are we here, 30, 30 months. And they're saying that's uh, the second fastest on record, uh, or at least going back to 1981. That was the fastest, but that recession was nowhere as significant. And they compare it to the GFC, where it went down at its maximum by 6.29%. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and it went back up, or it got back up to its prior high uh, 10 years later. So it took over 77 months for the GFC, for the jobs market, to quote-unquote recover. And uh, during the survey sickness, again, it only took 30 months. So they're saying that this means the economy is incredibly strong. But... Let's think through the difference of the survey sickness compared to the GFC. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, remember what? how many uh, stimmy checks went out during the GFC. Ah, oh, that's right. Well, one did. I remember that. I think Bush sent out like a $500 stimmy check. But uh, what else? I mean, we, we didn't lock everyone in a cage. Okay, well, that's one difference. Uh, people's checking account balances didn't go up by 150 percent. Uh, that's for sure. So when you combine the mortgage moratorium, the student uh, loan, forbearance, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> uh, or the rent moratorium, I, I can't remember all the terms they use. But whether it was a forbearance, a moratorium, or just putting your payments on hold, they didn't do that during the GFC. You had to bite the bullet, and if you went bust, if you lost your savings, it was just, that's the way the market works. And uh, there wasn't the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in stimmy checks. There wasn't the increase in unemployment to a level that was triple your income. So... I don't know that I would sit here and argue the reason we've had such a quick recovery is because the market or the economy is so strong. 
No, it's because the government gave out quote unquote free money. And we're going to have to pay the price for that, which we are paying through the rate of inflation. So you can sit there and say, okay, we want the economy to recover in 30 months. Okay, fine. But are you willing to pay 10% inflation to get there? That's your choice. So are people better off now than they were during the GFC? I think that's a debatable question. I mean, are people better off now that the jobs market has quote unquote recovered with inflation at let's say 10% than they were at the depths of the GFC, let's say in 2009, 2010, where the unemployment rate was far higher. The, I don't know what the labor force participation, I'm sure that was probably better, but, uh, the jobs market wasn't booming, but yet we didn't have 10% inflation. We had 1% inflation, 1.5% inflation as measured by the government. Where was the poor and middle class as a whole better off? I would argue during the GFC. But my point here is it's not this red line that you see going parabolic in a recovery. This isn't due to the economy. This is just due to the government handing out stimmy checks I, for the most part. I mean, and they we're trying to spin it as though we're somehow far more productive. No, not at all. And uh, as you guys know, there's no free lunch. And so we're probably, or we're definitely going to have to pay the price for the sins that were committed over the past two years for the next two years if not even longer. Now let's let's move on here and try to address this topic of could the government just flat out be lying about the jobs numbers? And to, to think this through, I kind of went back and tried to find some stories throughout history where this might have been applicable. And after about a half hour of digging, I found Germany in the 1930s. Now I can't say uh, the group that was in charge here, you guys know what I'm talking about. We have to keep it YouTube friendly. And if, if, unfortunately, in today's world, as grown adults, we're not allowed to say certain words. <laughs> like a kid where you have to like spell out the four-letter word. That's how our our social media mandarins are cheating us or are treating us today. Uh, you know, just like the kids that you have to spell out S H I T. Uh, we have to spell out N A Z I. We're just kind of give you uh, the 1930s Germany. Wink, wink. <laughs> All right, but I don't want to go too far off on a tangent. Let's look at what they did with their uh, jobs numbers, which I've, I I didn't know that this was a thing, and it absolutely was because. Part of their economic miracle is what they called it. They wanted to create an economic miracle. And when uh, the certain individual took power in 33, unemployment was very high. And they wanted to almost, their objective was to eradicate unemployment by 1939 or uh, to the degree to which they could. So what this article points out is the unemployment numbers. So in 33, there were 6 million Germans unemployed. And that number dwindled to 302,000 in 1939. So they could come out and say, hey, look, it's an economic miracle. And I'm sure many people in the, the Western media and whatnot were saying how this is completely miraculous. And oh my gosh, this fascism, this economic fascism thing, and the government and central planning well, this, this is fantastic. The United States isn't reducing unemployment at this rate. You know, we're living through the Great Depression. Maybe we should try ourselves some dictatorship and economic fascism. And I, I say that jokingly, but you guys know darn well that if uh, we did even more research, that you could find articles in Time Magazine or you know some of these uh, progressive magazines of the time and, and today that probably argued this just like they argued 
how communist Russia was an economic miracle. But then the article goes on to say that in hindsight, we could tell that it wasn't necessarily an economic miracle, but it was more so kind of maybe a little bit of that. But the majority of this decline in unemployment was a result of just fiddling with the numbers. As an example, women were no longer included in the statistics. So any women who remained out of the workforce under Nazi rule did not exist as far as the statistics were concerned. And you could see how the government would just explain that away. Well, of course, why would we include women? Because now the economy is booming to such a significant degree that women don't even have to work. They can just stay at home and 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 watch the kids. You know, it reminds me of when uh, the unemployment rate was going, or what was that, where... Uh, the, the Democrats came out, I can't remember exactly when it was, but the unemployment rate was sky high or something like that. And they are arguing how that was actually beneficial because then people could pursue their, their real passion and start their own business. They wouldn't be held hostage by a job. <laughs> it's always this crazy government spin. But uh, another thing they did is the in, in Germany, the unemployed were given a simple choice. Do whatever work is given to you by the government. It sounds very similar to a jobs guarantee program, doesn't it? Where have we heard this before? Uh, or you'd just be put in a concentration camp. So I guess work for the government. And what do they do? I, throughout the article, they basically had them doing jobs like digging ditches, planting trees, uh, rejuvenating forests and things that... Uh, actually, they, uh, they uh, built the Autobahn as well. Kind of fun fact. So they're doing these things that were they kind of worthwhile? Maybe, maybe. Uh, were they worth the doubling of government spending? Probably not. When you look at the cost benefit analysis. So Jews lost their citizenship in 1935. So obviously we can't include non-citizens in the unemployment number. <laughs> so basically, you eliminate women, you eliminate Jews, you put a gun to someone's head and say, either you work or you go into a concentration camp. And magically, the unemployment number goes down. <laughs> oh, oh, well, we're, not done. we're not done yet. And many of the young men were taken off unemployment because they went, oh, because they went into the military. There we go. So if you take your military from 400,000 to 1.4 million, uh, that's another way to eliminate the or reduce the unemployment rate. And then if you said anything about it, then you were put in the Gestapo, which is the direction that we're going today with misinformation and disinformation. So if you say that we're in a recession, how dare you? That is misinformation, and the government is going to change the definition of what it truly means to be in a recession. And we are not in a recession until we say we are in a recession. Obviously, they're not putting us in a Gestapo as of yet, but uh, definitely trying to do that with an online version of putting you on a timeout <laughs> during the cerveza sickness. And like I said, I think in the future, we'll see the same thing, but instead of, we'll call it health, disinformation. It'll be economic disinformation. We've talked about that on many videos uh, on this channel. So this is just an example of kind of shenanigans that governments have employed, no pun intended, in the past to reduce the unemployment rate. So is the United States doing this to a certain degree today? Maybe, maybe not. But let me argue or how we could reconcile the jobs numbers with the yield curve, with the negative GDP prints, with the uh, another thing that went up uh, significantly here that I wrote down was the um, unemployment benefits or the requests for unemployment. Uh, that skyrocketed as well. So you've got all of these things that... Uh, are 
or the unemployment claims. That's what I was looking for. Just saw it here in my notes. So you've got all these things that would suggest we are in or headed for a recession. And then you have this one outlier. Uh, so how could we maybe reconcile that one outlier with what the rest of the data are saying? Uh, could there be an explanation other than the government in the United States is taking the same approach as the government did in Germany in the 1930s? <laughs> so first thing I want to show you is, uh, and Snyder's been talking about this, so got to give a hat tip to him. The way they come up with this headline jobs number is uh, twofold. There's two surveys that go into this. Number one is called the establishment survey. Number two is the household survey. The establishment survey is really when they are just questioning and polling certain businesses and government entities saying how many people are on your payroll as of right now? Pretty broad question. And uh, there's a few more questions. And then the household survey is more based on the individual. They're different. Now, ironically enough, the household survey is what is used to determine the, the headline unemployment number, U3. But when you look at the differences between the two, it starts to potentially explain how we could have this divergence from what we're seeing on this side with the data, looking at the yield curve, GDP, the unemployment uh, claims, compared to over here with explosive, absurd, what, what's the title they used? Astonishing, I'm sorry, astonishing. <laughs> job growth, <laughs> astonishing job growth. And, and maybe it could be explained by the difference between the two surveys. Because just to be clear, the headline number they use is the establishment survey. But look at this chart of the establishment survey compared to the household survey from March of 2022 we see this massive delta starting to form where the establishment survey shows jobs are going up, 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 and up where, or I should say job creation, where the household survey is showing that it's flatlining. This household survey would be consistent with everything that we talked, everything we talked about over here, the yield curve, negative GDP, unemployment claims, et cetera. So let's now look at the difference that could that could explain uh, why we see such a divergence in that chart. So one thing I'd like to point out, and this is a uh, disentangling the jobs report. Now this is going back to 2019, which uh, is another interesting bit of information from the standpoint of this was the last time when we saw a massive divergence to the point where the household survey actually went negative while the establishment survey was continuing to go up. And this author, uh, Jeffrey Stupak, is, um, I know he's an economist. Uh, sorry, Jeffrey, don't know your exact title here. Uh, analyst in macroeconomic policy. I'm not sure where. Okay. But uh, he points out that uh, one of the main reasons we could have this different is difference is because the, let me find it here so I can highlight it for you. The establishment survey basically double counts jobs where the household survey, if one person has two jobs, it's still only listed as one person working where I maybe said a better way. If uh, one person has two jobs, the establishment survey counts that as two actual people working when it's actually just one person with two jobs. So let's see. 
Well, actually, let's go to. Yeah, it was here in this. Well, I'm not going to take the time to find the exact point where it uh, describes this phenomenon. But that's the bottom line is you get a double counting with job or you can have a double counting in jobs from the establishment survey because it's just a, a grand total instead of how many people are actually working. So this could so, so how would this play out in the real world? Well, you'd have a situation where there are fewer full-time jobs. So you've got a hundred, let's just say uh, 10 full-time jobs that are eliminated, right? Those people are fired. And then they replace those 10 full-time jobs with 14 part-time jobs. Okay, well, this would be a way where uh, on net balance, the job market is less dynamic. And it's less, uh, it's producing less with the 14 uh, part-time jobs than the 10 full-time jobs. But you would have the report show an explosion of growth. So I'm not saying this is definitively the, the, the discrepancy or how we reconcile uh, without just attributing it to government malfeasance. But it is something that uh, I think is definitely significant. And it could, it could uh, explain why we're seeing a chart that looks like this. And then, uh, you know, it could explain why uh, this green line may be the outlier. see disentangling jobs now let's go over to uh gdp and i wanted to just kind of outline some idiosyncrasies with the numbers here because I, I i'm not sure most people are aware of the fact when you get a negative quarter in gdp it, it's they're they're not saying specifically this quarter was a negative print they're they're annualizing a, a a number so they're saying that if this uh i i believe they're taking it back the prior uh three quarters including the current quarter and then they're coming up with a a total annual rate uh versus just that specific quarter let me give the numbers and it'll it'll make more sense here i don't think i'm describing it well so in the last quarter real gdp decreased 0.9 percent at an annual rate but the quarterly rate was negative 0.2, where the second quarter or the first quarter, uh, the decrease was 1.6 on an annual rate, but 0.4% on a quarterly rate. So I don't know that that's going to help us really explain the divergence uh, in the outlier of the jobs report, but I thought that was interesting. And uh, I thought it was definitely something that I wanted to share with you guys just for future reference. So I think the main takeaway is uh, when we're looking at the jobs numbers, I, I don't wanna fall prey to trying to cherry pick data to fit my specific belief system or my base case, right? Because my base case, it might not be that we're in a recession now. I don't think the economy, I definitely don't think the economy is booming, uh, that's for sure. I think that there's a good chance we're in a recession as indicated by all of these things over on my right that we talked about earlier. Uh, but I, and even if we're not in one now, I think we're headed there in the you know, next couple quarters, maybe the first uh, quarter or so of 2023. But I don't want to just cherry pick data to fit that narrative. That That's the opposite of what I want to do. I, I want to try to poke holes in it. And the only thing that I can find to poke holes in the narrative is just the unemployment rate or these uh, uh, the, the the jobs report that we found or that was uh, that was delivered last week. So, but then in going through that, when you get into the nuance, that's where you start to find problems that bring me personally back to this base case as far as uh, being the highest probable outcome in my mind. 
So is the government outright lying? Uh, maybe, but I think there's other ways to explain the the discrepancy that would just uh, that that would eliminate malicious intent. <laughs> there's there's other ways to explain it that maybe uh, maybe or maybe not uh, less or far more accurate. Uh, I don't know. I'll let you be the judge. Maybe you come to the conclusion that uh, government lying is probably the most realistic explanation. Uh, but there's other things out there in the data and the way the data is collective, collected that uh, would also make a lot of sense. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market capitalism. We'll see you in the next video.